Hello. Can everyone hear me all right? Awesome. Welcome, Poland. Welcome, Warsaw. Thank you very much for having me. Um, this is actually my second time at Front Trend, so it's an, I was an absolute pleasure to be invited to be back here on this stage. And as Olga was just saying, the community here is incredible, so it's amazing to be back sharing this experience with all of you. Um, my name is Patrick Hammond. You can catch me on Twitter, at Patrick Hammond. Again, please come and speak to me in the break or uh, in the pub this evening. I'd love to find out what you're all building, what you're up to. I love speaking to people, finding out what everyone does. Um, I work at Fastly. We're an edge cloud provider that specializes in real-time content delivery. So essentially, we're a CDN. And my role there is a web performance engineer, where I get a lot of time to think about and research how to make our customers' websites and therefore their user experience of their customers' websites load as fast as possible. So why am I here to talk to you today specifically? And you're probably wondering what that loaded title of the first meaningful paint even means. And so to start with, I want to ask you a question of how fast is your website or the website that you're building for a customer or a client or your company that you are building this week? Do you know that? What does it mean to be fast? What does that even mean? Is it how long it takes to load? Is it how long it takes for a user to achieve something on the website you're building? But most importantly, in what context does fast being mean? And hopefully, we'll start to understand that fast means different things in different contexts, depending on what the user is trying to do. And do you know how you measure the performance of your website? Can you all think about now about how you're tracking what the user experience and how fast your website actually is. And so for years, we've been searching for that golden performance metric, the one which we should all optimize for. But again, I ask the question, like, should that exist? Does it exist? I would argue that it probably shouldn't, because being fast and a user experience is a moving target. It isn't a single point in time. And the reality is most performance metrics have almost nothing to do with user experience, or at least the, the ones that we used to optimize our websites for. Time to first byte, document complete, the load event, or we start fretting over how many requests we have on our page, or how many bytes we send down the wire, or our start render. But in reality, often, these are all metrics to track how our pages were built, but they don't directly correlate to a nice user experience. And we start optimizing our stack for the sake of optimizing our stack. But load is an experience. There is no single load metric. And so luckily, times are changing. And a new collection of metrics focused purely around user experience are emerging, such as the speed index, first meaningful paint, which is what we're going to focus on today, time to interaction. And I can't stress this bottom one enough, custom metrics. We need to be thinking about metrics specific to our business use and users' needs. So for a search page, that might be how long it took a user to find what they were looking for. A news organization, how long it took the user to find that headline that they came here for. An e-commerce site, how long did it take someone to find the product or click the buy button or put it in their shopping cart? We, we should be thinking about custom metrics specific to humans, human-centric metrics around the experience that our users, what did the user actually come here for and not how we built our website. And so when you focus on user-centric metrics, any optimizations that you do to achieve that metric will ultimately be improving the user experience and therefore better for your clients, your customers, and our users. So what does time to first meaningful paint, or TTFMP or FMP, which I'm probably going to um, use the acronym for the rest of this talk, to put simply, first meaningful paint is the time when a page's primary content appeared on the screen. And so if you think about mobile, this is just the viewport. It's, we only care about the first viewport and when the, specifically the primary content. So for instance, in a news organization, that would be when did the text of the article appear on the screen, not how quickly I can render my app shell architecture that we're all starting to use now. More detailed, it's the first paint after which the biggest above the fold, remember it's the, the, only the first viewport, layout change has happened. So layout is when your browser converts your DOM or elements and objects to an X and Y coordinate and a width and a height. So we actually give 
dimensions to every element, and that is when we call layout, and so it's the biggest amount of those layout objects being painted to the screen. And I can't forget this enough when web fonts have loaded, because I, I hear that we all like loading custom web fonts these days, much to my discretion and disgruntlement, because web fonts, by their pure nature, are very heavy. They could take up to three seconds to load, and so the user came here to, to read something. There's no point in measuring your performance of your speed if there's no text on the screen. So the, the metric also takes into consideration when web fonts are loaded. This is probably better represented visually. So, um, TTFMP is a, a very new metric, first meaningful paint that some uh, smart folks at Google coined last year, and they wrote a white paper about it, which you can find on this link here, and I'll share these slides afterwards. But in the white paper, it states how you go about ascertaining the first meaningful paint. And on the top graph here, on the x-axis, is the amount of objects that were painted to the screen, and sorry, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is time and correlated to the Google search uh, page loading. And as you can see here, Google are very clever that they flush the head of their document very quickly, uh, even before they send the search query to the database, so you can start rendering. But the first meaningful paint was actually here at 1.9, because we can see that that directly correlates to the amount of elements on the screen. And you can see here that this is a much better human-centric metric for us to focus on, rather than how long our page took to load or to start to render. This, again, might be better visually represented like this. We can see it in a timeline. So have a, I want to play a game here. Think, who thinks it's 3.5, 4.5, 4.5, 5, 5.5? So some people are saying 5 around here. So yes, the, t the first meaningful paint for the FT.com homepage currently on a 3G emerging market network is actually 5 seconds. So you're probably wondering, how can you go about ascertaining this for yourself and for the metrics that you, uh, for your websites you're building? Unfortunately, this metric isn't exposed yet in a JavaScript API, so we can't use RUM monitoring to do this. However, we are discussing that as a, uh, as a wider community. For, so currently, the only way of ascertaining what your um, FMP is is to use Google's Lighthouse performance auditing tool. It, Lighthouse was built to measure progressive web apps and how well um, your progressive web app conforms to best practices. But it turns out it's actually just a very good tool for also auditing uh, normal performance of your website. So you can get this via a browser extension or via CLI, node-based CLI tool, so you can integrate it as part of your build process or continuous integration tool and alert and budget on that. So let's dive straight into the meat. How, why am I here? How can we actually optimize our websites for, to achieve a fast, first meaningful paint? And to do this, we're going to look at the past, present, and future best practices of asset loading in the browser. And hopefully, we'll give you a framework and methodology so that you can take home and apply these techniques to your own websites and, and have fast, meaningful paints at home. And so it's really easy to create uh, lab test cases of static websites to do MVC apps to try and prove benchmarks and show experience. But I feel that it's much better to use real-world uh, case studies to try and optimize for. Because at the end of the day, a to-do MVC app only has two assets, a JavaScript file and some HTML. And so it's quite easy to optimize them. But we're, we're all building real websites for our real users. And we like to throw a metric crap ton of JavaScript down the pipe, and it all goes wrong. And so for today, we're going to use um, the FT.com homepage to optimize for the research of this talk. And just a disclaimer here, I used to work for the Financial Times. Um, they do have a very fast website, and they have a team dedicated to, uh, to helping user experience. But we can do better, and they've given me permission to do this. So each optimization that we apply is going to be run through web page tests. Um, if you haven't used web page tests before, I urge you to go and try it out. It's the number one tool in my arsenal of performance uh, testing for two reasons. The first one is that it allows me to test on real devices. There is really a Moto G at the end of this form. And it allows me to test on real network conditions, such as 3G emerging markets. These are the conditions that your users are actually using in the real world. And I can't stress this enough, 
um, contrary to popular belief, the shiny iPhone or Google Pixel that you might have in your pocket right now is not the average phone in the world. The average phone is actually a very low-powered, medium-spec Android device that has terrible CPU performance and hardly any memory. So you need to be testing your websites on those characteristics and not just in your lab or your iPhone at home. So we need to ask ourselves these questions. What is the average profile of your user? Where are they based? In what is their device landscape? What type of devices are they using? In what context are they using your, your website? And when people try and tell me, oh, I only have one context because I'm building a web app for a specific type of people, I don't believe that. Because even if you're building a website for one or two people, they're going to be using your website in different contexts. They might be using it on a terrible 3G connection on the way into work on their low-powered Android. And then when they get into work, yes, they might be using it on a desktop connection. There is not a single context for any of the websites that you're building. What is the network profile of these people? And most importantly, what did they come here for? That is what you should be optimizing for, a very good user experience for that. So you need to ask yourself these questions and set your own budgets. So for today, for the FT.com research, we're going to use these budgets. But please don't take these as lies in the sand. You, should, you need to go and create your own profiles and set budgets for them. So we're going to try and achieve a first meaningful paint within three seconds on a 3G emerging market. So that is a 400 millisecond round trip time, which is quite slow. So that's the time it takes from a request to go from the client to the server and back again, just for a single uh, um, request takes 400 milliseconds. So you can imagine if you're making three of those, you're already over a second. Um, and one second on cable. But again, I can't stress this enough. You need to go and create your own profiles and benchmarks and bud set budgets against them. So to be able to see that we are optimizing um, well enough, we need to measure the impact of each test against the baseline. And so to do this, I've set up a baseline for us. And this is as simple as it gets. It's a HTML file with the ft.com homepage content inside it. And it just has a link element with a single style sheet. This is how we should be, have been developing our website since the birth of cascading style sheets. Just one document and one inline reference, just a link element to a compiled CSS file. I don't care how that CSS file was compiled, whether or not it was written in JavaScript or you have an elaborate build process. This is probably how the majority of you are delivering your CSS assets today. And so if we were to run this in web page test, we'd get this network waterfall. Hands up if you um, use waterfalls or re no, like on, a, on a daily basis. Doesn't really matter. It's cool. So what a waterfall is that on the x-axis is time. And on the y-axis, it's requests in the order that they happened and the priority in the browser. Now, Web Page Test does an awesome thing there. It gives us also the MIME types. So we can see that HTML is blue, CSS is green, images are purple, JavaScript is orange, and fonts are red. And for each one of these segments, it gives us two colors, a light shade and a dark shade. The light shade is when the request was initiated and we're waiting for the response. And then the dark shade is how long it took to download. So they're quite easy to read. And then we've got a green line here, which is where we started to render. Unfortunately, Web Page Test yet doesn't give us another line for our first meaningful paint, but it's a good indication of when we started to paint. So if we were to run our baseline test through Web Page Test on our profiles, we get these results, that we have a first meaningful paint of about 8,600 milliseconds on a 3G emerging market and um, 2,000 on cable, so way above our budget. So let's dive straight in now and start to optimize them. And the first experiment, what we're going to do is to inline some of our critical CSS. And many of you may have heard of this technique before. In fact, I've personally been advocating it since about 2014 and was on this very stage at Front Trends three years ago talking in depth about the technique. So let's just have a quick recap of what this is. To do that, we have to look at our critical rendering path that our um, the path at which our browser takes to render to the page. First, we perform a GET request for our HTML. It goes to the network. 
we start getting the response back, and HTML can be parsed incrementally to build the DOM. This is an amazing feature of the specification. It means that we don't have to wait for the whole file to be downloaded as we can construct the DOM. It's very powerful. But then we'll find that link element inside our, that we saw reference in our HTML, and we have to go back to the network, perform a GET request for that CSS file, and wait for all of that before we can construct the CSS object model. Now, CSS, unlike HTML, can't be parsed incrementally. We have to wait for the whole file to be downloaded before we can construct it. And this is a good reason for that, because if you had a style declaration at the bottom of your CSS file that overwrit something that was declared at the top, maybe changing color, and if we were to constantly paint, we'd get flash of moving around and unsell content. For, for that reason, CSS is, one, it's render blocking, so we have to wait for the response and it can't be parsed incrementally. Once we have all of those things together, we can form a render tree and paint to the screen. Now, there's two things to note here. The first one is that we have a lot of idle time on the render thread whilst we're waiting for our CSS to come back on the network. So we're wasting time here. The browser's doing nothing during this time. And the second, most important one is, what if that CSS request was to fail? Imagine I was on Twitter, I clicked on a link for ft.com homepage, I downloaded all the HTML, I now have all of the content I need to be able to read the news, and then I go into a tunnel, and then this network request fails. I have all the information I need, but I don't have the information to paint, so I'm just going to be looking at a white screen. A lot of you probably see this on a daily, daily basis. So we've, what we've actually done here is we've created a single point of failure on CSS. So you might see where I'm going with this, what if we were to inline the critical styles just for my first meaningful paint, i.e. everything in above the fold viewport, into our document and not have it in a CSS file, then we have given the browser all of the information it needs within a first TCP round trip, and we can render instantly. But then we have to declare our non-critical CSS as asynchronous. And so this is how we've done that in our FT.com example. We now have a style element at the top that has all of um, our critical styles in line. This goes against everything that we have been taught of styles, of separation of concerns, styles in CSS, behavior in JavaScript. But, and then we declare our non-critical CSS as asynchronous. To do this, I'm using the filament group's load CSS function. Um, it, don't worry about the implementation. It's more about the methodology. So, and we're also using our new friend link rel preload, which we're going to find out about in a second. So let's look at our baseline waterfall again. So we got the HTML, we then got the CSS, and then we didn't paint until much later. The impact of inlining our critical CSS is it's dramatically moved our start render and therefore our first meaningful paint. Because within inside the blue strip now, we've given the browser everything it needs. It still hasn't even finished downloading the HTML, but it's been able to paint because it has everything it needs. And the CSS, the secondary CSS, is now asynchronous. It doesn't affect the first painting of the page. So what's that done to our results? That's had a um, dramatic improvement of a 63% improvement. We now have 1,300 millisecond first meaningful paint on cable and 3,200 on mobile, just by inlining some CSS. But with everything in life, this comes with some pros and cons. We now have no blocking resources, which is great. We've eliminated that single point of failure on the CSS, but it's not cacheable. Every time I want to change my critical CSS, I'm going to be invalidating the cache of all of the HTML. So if you imagine a website like ft.com, you're going to be invalidating millions of pages every time you change a CSS file. And it's very hard to maintain this separation between the two of them. I've worked on some very large websites, and this has been one of our trickiest problems, is how do we manage our separation of our critical CSS from our non? And if you want to talk about that at length, please come and grab me afterwards. And because it's not cacheable, we're going to be sending unnecessary bytes down the wire every time, because we're not benefiting from the browser's HTTP cache. So, now that we've been able to get our CSS or our critical styles down as soon as possible, how can we prioritize other resources required to achieve our first meaningful paint, i.e. the critical resources for our page? And I want to ask you a question of what are the critical resources for the website you're building today? Can you think of them? If you could only have two or three assets that the browser received that would give you a first meaningful paint, can you think about what they are? 
It's actually quite a hard thing to do, especially, well, I, I found it quite hard. So let's try and do that together for the FT.com homepage. Is it the logo? Is it the fonts? And we know that the user came here to read something, so it probably is the fonts. Is it the hero image? Apologies, I must say, for this Theresa May photo bomb as well. I'm very annoyed that she's made her way into my slide deck. Uh, she definitely doesn't deserve it. Um, fortunately, Lighthouse has got our back here. And so we don't need to do that thinking ourselves. And we can run our pages through Lighthouse, and it will give us our critical request chain. It tells us for FTCOT homepage, there's five critical requests to require the first meaningful paint. And if you were going to take away one thing from my talk today, please let it be this, that you need to find out what your critical resources are, eliminate as many of them as possible. Do we need the hamburger icon, really? And then when you've got it down to the smallest amount of resources you can, optimize those assets and prioritize the delivery of those assets. That is the golden trick for getting a fast loading website. I could just walk off the stage now because I've told you that. That is the one thing to take away from this talk. So if we go back to the TTFMP um, definition, we know that we require web fonts to be able to achieve our first meaningful paint. But if we look at the waterfall of the FT.com, you'll see that web fonts are very low down in the priority of the loading. Why is this? Especially they're way after all of the images that are below the fault. And so to do this, we have to go back to our critical path to understand how browsers work again. We make the HTML request, HTTP request for the HTML. We then do the same for our CSS. We have to wait for all of that to be downloaded. And so we now have a CSS object model and a document object model. And these two things are combined to form what's known as the render tree. Because the DOM it could be very large if you have a lot of things in your DOM. But your CSS might be hiding, for instance, a whole block of text because you've said display none on it. And so what the render tree actually is, is just your DOM, but only the visible bits of the DOM that are going to be painted. Any of the things that the styles have said, display none or hide off the screen, aren't going to be in the render tree. And the reason why I've told you this is that web fonts, are the, the, font, the network request for web fonts is only initiated once the render tree is constructed. Because there would be no point in downloading six font families if the, they're going to be in a div that is displayed none. And web fonts are very, very expensive resources. So for this reason, browsers don't um, even find out about fonts until the render tree is constructed. But we've wasted a lot of time here, especially as we know as the authors that you are going to need these specific fonts. So fortunately, the Web Performance Working Group has got our back here, and they've defined a new API called Preload, which allows the author of a web page to indicate to the browser what are the critical or, most importantly, hidden sub-resources that you're not going to find these resources until you, get, you construct the render tree, but I know you're going to need them. It allows us as the authors to dictate this. So to put simply, it provides a declarative fetch primitive that initiates early fetch, but most importantly, it separates fetching from resource execution. So the resources won't be executed or used, for instance, in like JavaScript, but we can tell the browser to perform the networking for them as soon as possible. So this is perfect for web fonts. So this is what it looks like. We now have three new primitives, one in HTML using the link element with rel preload, one in JavaScript. I think this is really powerful. Not enough people are using this. You can imagine if I have a user that's hovering over a button to expand a carousel, I could, just as the user's hovering over that button, I could dynamically inject loads of preload elements for all the images in that carousel. So when they do click on it, it's going to be instant loading. All the images are already going to be there. And my favorite, it's the often underlooked link header on our HTTP responses. We now can semantically, using a link header, declare all of the critical resources for our page just on our HTML response. And so that's what we're going to do for our FT.com test. Is Now this is the response from FT.com. We're going to add those critical resources that were identified by Lighthouse at the beginning, those five resources, and declare them here. There's two important things to note with this. The first one is the as font and cross origin. You have to declare MIME types on them, especially as fonts are deemed cross origin. And the no push directive. Just remember that for later on in the talk. So now our waterfall, before we apply the preload hints, remember the fonts 
are really low down in the priority here. And just by adding these HTML, HTTP headers, we can do this, that we've told the browser these are very, very important resources. You're not going to find them, but please go and perform the networking for them. And hopefully, you can imagine that this is going to have a dramatic improvement on our first meaningful paint. So now we have a 64% improvement just by adding four HTTP responses to tell the browser about our critical resources. We're now hitting our budget on cable of 1,000 and 42 milliseconds, and we're close on emerging markets. But again, this comes with some costs. We now have the ability to indicate hidden resources that the browser won't find, but it's very easy to create contention. You can imagine you can just go and declare all of the assets on your page as preload, but all you're going to do is create contention on the network. With great power comes great responsibility, and it just requires some custom server logic to do this. So we could just stop there, right? We've improved our TTFMP by 64% for, on top of our baseline. But surely we can do more. And one such option is HTTP2 server push. So now after 20 years, that's staggering, 20 years we have a new version of the underlying transfer protocol of the internet, HTTP. And I can do a whole talk just about this technology. I am fascinated by it and, and love it, and I urge you to find out more, but we can't go into much detail today. Just, uh, interestingly, how many people are using H2 in production already? Okay, so only about 10% of you, which is less than I thought. I asked the same question in Berlin a couple of weeks ago, and it was about 30%, which is interesting. So it's still not enough is the answer to that. And so H2 has got an amazing feature. And so first, we need to look at the traditional request flow of loading a website. The um, client, the browser, performs a get request for the index page. The, browser, the server then thinks about it. It makes its database calls, renders some templates, and responds with that. Then the browser parses that document and requests that. And so we've wasted a lot of time here whilst the server was thinking and generating the response. And so what if the server could predict that the next thing the browser is going to ask for is that main CSS file and just push it down the connection for it whilst the server is doing its think time. Now the browser doesn't need to even initiate that request. And this is what HTTP2 calls a push, or more importantly, it calls it a push promise frame. HTTP2 now only shares a single TCP connection and requests are multiplexed along that connection. And they do that by data frames. And each data frame has a corresponding ID, and it allows us to interleave requests with each other. And so we have a new frame type of a push promise. This is the server saying, I am going to send you the bytes for the CSS file. You do not need to request them from me. And so how we can do this is by programmatically indicating which resources we want to be pushed to our H2-enabled server. So uh, for the purpose of the ft.com homepage, we're going to use the link header. And note, remember earlier I said that we had that no push directive. Now we don't. So any, this is what we've decided upon as a community, that the way that we can indicate to servers what resources we want to push is via the link preload header. And so now for ft.com, because we didn't um, want to inline our styles, we did it out of necessity, now we can put our critical CSS back into a real CSS file to benefit from caching, and we're going to push that down the wire as soon as possible. We still have our non-critical CSS as asynchronous. So let's have a quick look at actually what's happening on the network connection at the moment before we apply the optimization. First, we have some idle time when we send the get request for our HTML file, then we download it, and because we've inlined our CSS, we have a very fast start render and first meaningful paint. Then we have some more idle time waiting for the request and response of the main CSS. And there's our TTFMP. Now, you might be surprised at what happens when we push our critical CSS. We've actually pushed back our start render and our first meaningful paint. Um, and why is this? We're not using this idle time during the connection. And to understand this, we have to look at how HTTP2 servers priorit um, do prioritization. They use a prioritization dependency tree to determine the order in which bytes it should send down the wire. And that dependency tree states that HTML should have the highest priority over any other type of sub-resource. And because we've indicated to the H2 server 
that we want it to push the CSS, but on the response of the HTML via a link header, the server already has all of the bytes for the HTML and the bytes for the CSS. So it's going to choose which one it's, it's going to prioritize first. And of course, HTML should have a higher priority than CSS. Now, this behavior may be different depending on your H2 implementation, but most currently, both browsers and servers do this. Again, browsers also now have the ability to determine to the server which resources it thinks is the highest priority. And for instance, Chrome will send a data frame to the server saying, yes, I will accept your push promises, but I want the HTML first. And so because we've removed our inline CSS, we no longer have that start render during the parsing of the HTML. The interesting thing to note here is that we don't have any of the wait time for the resource on the critical CSS because the browser never made the request. We've pushed it, which is awesome. It just happened in the wrong order. So the results of this is we've actually, compared to our inline and our preload experiments, we've had a negative effect on our first meaningful paint. We now only have a 43% improvement on our baseline. And so the question is, should we be using server push at all? Or more importantly, is using the link rel preload header on the response of our documents, in fact, far too late in the connection state at all? And so how can we actually achieve that holy grail of pushing our critical resources during that idle server think time? And to do this, this is what at Fastly we're calling async push. And so we really want to be utilizing this server think time at the beginning of our request. That's when we should be pushing resources. And so a more common architecture is there for a HTTP server to be decoupled from its application server. Think about a reverse proxy. Probably most of the applications you build have an application server, and then you have something like Nginx or Apache sitting in front of your servers. And it's this thing that will have H2 enabled on it. So what we really want is for the browser to make the request that hit the application server, and whilst that's going and doing its database lookups and rendering, it's at this point that we push our CSS before we even get the response. So to do this, we need to decouple from the link headers. And so we, if we, we can only do this if we have programmatic access um, to our open network connection. So here's an example using Node's HTTP2 implementation. And the implementation details doesn't really matter. It's more about the, the theory behind this. And so if you imagine this is an Express-style middleware, the first thing I'm doing at the top of the request before I go and look up my data or render my template is I'm flushing the bytes of my critical CSS file down the network connection. And then I respond with the data for the HTML. This is how you perform asynchronous pushing. And so this is the result of doing that. So note the location now of our critical CSS. It's not after the blue line. It's during the, the idle time waiting for it. We've achieved our holy grail of pushing our resources before the browser even gets any HTML. We've given it everything it needs to be able to paint, even before it received a single byte of HTML. And so now we've had our breast improvement so far of 66% on our baseline. And we have hit our budget of 3,000 milliseconds, first meaningful paint, on a very low-powered Android device on a 3G emerging market. So this comes with some pros and cons. It's easy to create contention on the network, very limited availability, and it requires a lot of custom server logic to do this. And so I'm hoping that this is a space that we as an industry are going to be uh, working on a lot over the coming years to make this much easier for us to manage our resources like this. And once push is very useful in the first view, what we haven't thought about is what happens on the repeat view. The, the user will have something in their cache but I'll still push those resources. So we're actually going to be congesting the network with resources that they've already had. And I wanted to talk to you about how we could use service workers to solve this problem, but I've completely ran out of time. But I want you to go and um, research the purple pattern from Google that tries to solve this problem. So using a combination of techniques, we've been able to achieve our target goals. And let's briefly compare the results to our baseline. Remember, all of this is with these human-centric, user experience-focused metrics. So the best way to show you this is the visual improvement that we've had for the user on a timeline on the FT.com. This is the final experiment using async push. What does this look like, actually, if we were to be on a low-powered device? 
you can see that we're much, much faster than our baseline. So hopefully I've given you a framework and set of methodologies to use. Now, we've got a strong toolbox of APIs now. We have push, we have preload, but the future is looking bright. We outlined that the weakness around server push is that the link rel preload header is far too late in the connection state. Um, you end up getting a congested network. And this is where the 103 early hints specification comes in. My colleague Kazuo at Fastly has recommended this to the IETF. And the, no one really knows about the 100 status code range. It's the informational status codes. And so what this allows the server to do is push a response of 103 that only contains headers, it doesn't contain a body, of saying, I am going to send you a 200 response, but I'm still processing that. But here are some early hints of all of the critical resources that you're going to need for this page, so go and perform the networking for this now. And I think this is gonna be so powerful. And secondly, I mentioned that the, in the push examples, it's very easy to waste bandwidth by pushing resources that the client already have. We have no way of knowing what is in the browser's cache. And again, Kazuo has recommended an IETF um, specification around cache digest. And this is a way of the client telling the server, these are all of the things that I already have in my cache for um, this domain, you don't need to push any of these resources. And this in itself is gonna optimize websites, um, and I'm really, really excited by the possibilities. So in closing, it's been a whirlwind tour of asset loading in the browser, and we've only really scratched the surface of each methodology, but I hope I've given you some new techniques that you can take home and try. You should know that resource, hopefully you've learned that resource loading in the browser is harder than we thought it was. Bandwidth is often very underutilized. So identify your critical resources and request chains and use techniques like preload to indicate the hidden critical resources for your page, such as fonts. Try and push those resources, but only in the first view and only using idle time. And most importantly, always be testing. Never stop testing, but use human-centric and custom metrics specific to your customers' needs. Thank you.